welcome Shonak to this edition of the Doc Commune Talks. Thank you so much for coming in to share your perspective, your learnings, and your uh, and, and really sharing your fantastic wins uh, over the last six months or so. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it must of course be a source of great pleasure and joy for you, but let me tell you that even for us as fellow documentary filmmakers, it fills us with joy to see uh, somebody from our fraternity, um, you know, take his film to such heights. So congratulations once again for uh, the amazing wins that you've had both at Sundance and at uh, the Cannes Film Festival. Thank so I'm going to jump right into the conversation, um, Shanak, because I can uh, predict a lot of questions towards the end and I want to keep enough time for our Q&A session. Uh, and, and let me just uh, tell everyone that, you know, there is a little Q&A box. Uh, you, you'll see a little icon at the bottom of your screen. So you can click on that and, and write in your questions and, you know, we'll try our best to um, ask them all uh, of Shanak. So uh, to begin with Shanak, Tell us a little about this journey that you've had with uh, all that breeds. You've taken it, you know, across the world. It's won accolades. Um, and in a way, it, it sort of, you know, I mean, I, I was just thinking about it. The last couple of years have actually been fabulous for Indian uh, documentaries, if you think about it, right? So there was Pail Kabadia's film, then Rintu and Sushmit, and now yours. Um, are, we, are we getting better at navigating the global scenario? Uh, you know, what, what do you think is leading to this change? What has been your own experience, uh, you know, taking a film, an idea uh, to the international stage, you know, finding funding for it, uh, you know, and then, of course, also figuring out the festival strategy, you know, it, it all seems like this black box, right? Uh, and you have to, like, figure it all out. So tell us a little about your journey. How did you figure it out? How have you taken it? And, and how have you stayed true to, and I know this is something very important to you and as it is to every filmmaker, how have you stayed true to your own artistic vision through it all? Right, right. So thanks, uh, Aparna. So I think um, navigating is the key term here because I think it's essentially a question of stratagem and tactic because it's not like there's been a magical spring well of talent that suddenly like it's not like a sudden uptick of talent and one uh, especially should be careful to not um, diminish the uh, like incredible work that previous documentary filmmakers have uh, done right so so uh, i think what's important to uh, put a finger on is changes in the political economy of the circuit which have together sort of cumulatively helped a bunch of the films that you also uh, mentioned so, um, I mean, it's impossible for me to talk about this journey. Look, I'm still very much embedded in it, right? So I don't really, uh, the literature review of this will be out in a couple of years or something. So I'm still very much um, immersed in it. But if I were to give it a kind of like narrative frame, I would say that it's impossible to talk about it without first talking about this earlier film that I'd made called Cities of Sleep which was really the shoestringest of shoestrings uh, in terms of uh, budgets. And it was like one of those classic things, uh, um, uh, me and a very small crew of people, um, we had barely any, any money. So I was shooting the majority of the film myself. I edited most of the film myself. I ended up doing a lot of the sound myself, the color myself. You know, you're sitting on an iMac in your room and just like soldiering on. And uh, the only thing that you're sort of equipped or armed with is a kind of naive uh, bullish passion and you sort of like just go on right because the truth is that um, and I don't mean to jump uh, some of your subsequent questions but uh, the truth is that uh, you know the documentary form is far more accommodating and welcoming than the fiction form right and how it essentially for me began is that I um, I'm uh, I've always been and still am terrified of the behemoth that is the Bombay film industry. I've never worked as an AD and, you know, this whole thing of climbing the rungs as an assistant director is always been um, a bit, uh, uh, it, I've, it sounded a bit scary to me. So nonfiction allows for this kind of personal, more experimental sort of, and, you know, you think of an idea, you apply for a grant, you figure out pitching forms, and that's how you start. So that's how the initial sort of foray began with Cities of Sleep. Now that was, I can't do it again. Like it's impossible for me to do it again because it just like you do, you move worlds, right? And I'm sure if there are like um, documentary filmmakers who are listening, it really is a you're moving worlds. It's like physically, emotionally, in every way taxing. And after a while you feel like, 
there's a real real uh, danger of burnout so when i said that essentially the operative term in your question i think was how one navigates this circuit and it's really a question of tact and strategy is when by the time i started um, all that breeds i'd already gone through the whole rigmarole of um, cities of sleep right so essentially for the first one year and this is where we get into the business end of opening up the black box as you uh, put it the i think in the first year i was shooting less for a film but more for a demo reel you know so i knew that the main thing i think is patience right it's patience 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 at the end especially the kind of creative non fiction that a lot of us do there's even for people who are not just doing pure verity observational stuff there's you just have to show up to be able to document life right so so much of it is actually about the long haul of turning up ever, ever so frequently and inevitably it ends up taking two and a half three years minimum right i can't think of a good film that's taken less than that kind of time so um the first year therefore i mean because it's a marathon and not a sprint as the cliche goes i um uh, the first year what me and a very small motley group of people the same sort of people who had uh, set of people who had worked on uh, cities of sleep um uh, we basically decided that this is sort of a, we worked in very small bursts initially for the first say 6 to 9 months actually um and i only had like basically i'd made landmarks for myself in terms of this particular development grant at this time you know the usual shebang of things like um it fast and dance rebecca catapult uh, and so on and so forth so one knows that initially this is what's required for a development grant vaguely and for people who don't have like some people are already come in with producers attached and so on and i didn't have any of that initially right so basically me and aman man who works uh, with me like both of us initially started with um, we didn't know who would be attached what the eventual team would be so we've started basically saying that grants are the life rafts right to begin with so we said okay we have to have arrive by september say with a 10 minute and then we and we you start working um on the grant applications accordingly so initially i for the first part you're not a filmmaker for the first year you're, you're like a professional grant writer you know like that's what it uh, feels like so initially basically i uh, we had decided that the first year we're not going to expend all energy and like shoot long stretches especially make the uh, uh, i mean in series of sleep what had really burnt me out is to put in long stretches of a lot of work um um at a time when i didn't have resources so even though great stuff that would have made it self into the film i was getting i was on a uh, i didn't have the equipment or the resources for it to be uh, like you know like of the aesthetic levels that i wanted it to be so um, in initial part we just basically planned the we did a lot of uh, uh, very test have to figure out the rhythms and you know the cadences and uh, intuitively what uh basically comes to me um vis-a-vis the characters the space and so on so the first landmark was figuring out a good um document like a written thing and a demo reel after that the really important aspect of it of course is the pitching forums right and like we were just discussing uh uh, uh in the safe space a uh, five minute window out before this uh the um something like dockage of course was look it's undeniable dockage has be, was has been a bit of a one stop pit stop for all of us to figure out the ropes of the industry the pitching forums the and because it's also an incubation lab we're also constantly sculpting and chiseling what the object of the film is what the aesthetic strategies of the film uh, are um and also the circuit you know like these channel i didn't know anything before uh, pitching series of sleep in 2014 i think where um what the channel work was how to you know there's this one earlier model which is the uh, sort of a, you cobble together a patchwork funding through different broadcasting broadcasters outside right? that's uh, something that people have uh, done uh, i we didn't do that in this film at all but you sort of like figured out that okay these are the sort of like people involved and so on um in this film we decided that it would be more interesting to get producers on board eventually and this only also happened like the gate open for it via vaguely um, uh, doc edge because then we pitched other places called, like uh, sheffield talks uh, ifp uh, films and um, 
uh, IDFA forum, I think the Hong Kong forum, and so on and so forth, like a bunch of other forums. And what that does is that, like you know, it's a very small circuit actually. Once you have done, have, you've done the rounds, and then you meet people, and there would be somebody who eventually you'd like sort of gel with. Of course, like as you and all of us know that there'd be a hundred conversations where people would say you feel like you know bus abhi, uh, we're just like you go bus bank account vision we're about to like that's the sense one gets right but um and over time you get weathered to know that uh that kind of thing more often than not doesn't work out uh but eventually as like it's a bit of a slugfest and afterwards you'll meet somebody who's genuinely excited and interested and um we met our british producers and threw them the american producers uh after but um you eventually meet somebody who's interested in the idea and uh, uh, world building and it's a and then you again pitch uh, like 50 times over and finally you say okay now i'll start the film proper and then you uh, figure out who you want to work with as dps as editors and then begin the schedule so my two cents would be usually is that um because it's anywhere long haul maybe the initial bits where you're just figuring out what the narrative structure would be what the rhythms and cadences would be to just like earn your stripes for the film by really doing the verite bit over and over again uh, and even if it, like my film otherwise other is uh, like has lyrical interest and is not really verite but still it's a um, you still have to do it to figure that out so maybe to front load it and to do it in the beginning and then eventually once there's more resources whatever the amount of resources and each film has its own corresponding set of resources you know it's not like like some film will require a smaller amount, obviously. And I know it sounds like painfully obvious, but it really is something one has to over time, like scales depend entirely on the world building that you're uh, doing. And uh, it's only, I think around the second year, like at least for me, that's been the case. It's around the second year, like after eight or nine months or over that one starts properly doing the production schedule. Right, thanks so much for breaking that down in such great detail for us. Uh, I'm just wondering, and this again is a question that comes up also because of the kind of conversations we have at Top Commune, uh, you know, which is a mentoring program, as you know, um, and and the kind of conversations that I've had with you know others who've been um, sort of looking at international funding. It's also extremely challenging and very tiring, right? So, how do you how do you even build the emotional reserve to go on? Uh, you know, what was your own journey like? You know, were there points when you were like, okay, maybe this much and no further? Or was there a point when you were like, okay, maybe this is how much funding we can raise and, you know, I'll have to sort of figure it out within this. You know, tell us a little about that. You know, your own moments of triumphs and, you know, low points. What emotional reserves. <laughs> it's like, uh, look, the, okay, jokes about the thing is that I, uh, we all went through me and the uh, small team of people who work uh, same set of people who also work in Series of Street. We all went through the whole gamut of, oh God, what are we doing um, with Cities of Sleep? And uh, there, everything about, you know, the it feels like the scale of your film constantly enlarge after a forum. And you feel like, oh, you've spoken to this person, spoken to this person, and there's interest here, there's buzz here, and so on. And then over a while, over some time, you realize that a lot of the mails are not being answered or, you know, the usual script of uh, things. And then I think after a while, you realize that, look, the film has to be done, no matter what. And at some point, you'll, you know, figure out the finite set of resources that it requires. And then you somehow... Um, survive and make it through like that's the narrative in the previous film in this film like i was saying i was a bit more wizened coarsened and like uh you know i knew what was ahead so the turbulence of the stormy seas of the first non-fiction film that one goes uh, a sail without a life raft wasn't it wasn't as tumultuous uh, this time because we had sort of paced ourselves out and that really was the key i um, this time when I began the film, basically the main thing is, you don't, I didn't tell myself that I'm going to make the film now in the next three months. When you tell yourself that, well, this is going to take three years and this is just the first year, but to like what really helped was to make sort of these uh, landmarks and say that, okay, the first year is research and development. I'm only researching, I'm only doing development shooting. Then you're not also 
constantly whipping yourself over in terms of how good the material is and so on because very often you're shooting yourself initially right before you get the uh the proper people to come in and shoot so um i think that but at a more um cerebral level i would say that apart from the logistical end of it you become the person who can make the film you don't start off as that you become the person who's eventually has the emotional wherewithal to make the film anybody who started it knows that it's not like there's a choice no everybody knew that they haven't done an mba and gone into a corporate you know you've chosen to not occupy a certain strata of life and that means that a particular subset of that choice about life means that you're you also obviously enjoy what you're doing so i think uh, like to be able to have the discipline to um uh, focus or spotlight on what you derive joy out of or what you find rewarding in the practice is uh, is what takes a lot of time i am also constantly uh, all of us are obviously constantly grappling with it but i just know that what's better between say the previous film and this film is the sense of like stamina emotionally and like pacing oneself out and knowing that abhi sirf resource research or development hai it's fine it's fine even if there are fallow periods where it takes about um, three months where nothing uh, happens it's okay it's demonstrably okay it's fine so um, i think that really goes a long way you know and i'll also say this you know this um, in the previous one this uh, question you'd said that what has really changed in the scene the truth is that uh, at least uh, at any rate from in my case the i think a lot of the people who were making films before us would have made films that would have competed with the best films at sundance or venice or uh, cannes or any of these uh, the top four festivals and gotten it but the truth is that we've all been working in a profoundly anemic uh, documentary setup right i mean you can't if you're working on a budget of like that our regular institutions uh, provide it's uh, Um, it's very very diff- there's a reason why our films are constantly personal or have to premise their um, originality on just originality of idea itself and not so much craft you know and the reason is that how do you compete with a film that's been made for half a million dollars outside and how do you do it and you don't have the time and you don't have the crane and you don't have the you know all the uh, tamjam that they bring so it was never a le- level playing field to begin with and i think what's changed uh, to my mind is that because of the, uh, these forums and all of that you're able to access a few more resources and therefore what happens is that you're able to excite people that you really want to work with so for instance um, uh, this one particular dp who'd come in briefly to shoot with us this person called ben bernard whose films i'd seen because he shoots films with viktor kosakovsky so he shot aquarella and he worked on antipodas before that and i was really like my mind was blown when i saw those films so uh, i asked him to come or for instance you're editing with this person called charlotte bankson who was editing this ton of like really excellent documentaries but the thing is that i couldn't have done it in cities of sleep even though i think the like the idea might have merited it or it would have obviously been a different film a planet different planet if it was this thing but this time I, so it's what i'm trying to say is that that change in the political economy of the circuit where there's more resource coming because there are more conversations because of forums like these which turn like which prove to be these triggers to you know inaugurate these conversations that's what changes it it's not like there's been a sudden uh, ground swell of uh, magical talent no absolutely uh, tell me this shona i mean like you said you know any any film you begin working on it means an investment of a few years at the very least what gave you the confidence that this was the story you wanted to tell right so what was that sort of impulse that guided you through these years of staying with these particular people telling their stories finding something worth telling uh, you know just just curious right so okay this is a deeply personal answer uh, for me it's like um, so there's three things firstly if it satisfies uh, something in me uh, intellectually and philosophically that's uh, one the second is if there's obviously a sanctum in it which is emotionally moving but thirdly if it has something that one can only for the lack of a better word call charisma or aura you know if like there are 
images that intuitively come to you and you feel this kind of burning this thing um, of it that's the only thing that will sort of motor you through or that will power you through for the course of three years you know otherwise the flame will get extinguished and before you know it you'll be trudging on and life will become bleaker but um, i think uh, something that's exciting cinematically goes along so i'll tell you something that i that works well now for me so if i'm uh, writing for for this film also and and now trying to work on a fiction so i'm doing exactly the same thing so if you're working on a script you uh, like i make a column which are the functional bits where for the story for a three arc structure even in a doc doc you uh, you need these say functional bits for the second act or the third act all of that right but there's another column which is the dream images which are images that come to you which have a kind of you know like uh, i wanted the film to begin with this sort of nest of 150 rats that the camera travels meanderingly through now um over time what happens is that the uh, dream image column i think like for me uh, uh, starts filling and then there's the functional column and over time it's somehow making the fun- functional column also burn with some degree of intensity and the white board that we had set up over time as the kitty of shots that we were thinking of and so you say oh yes i shot like you know that kind of, and there's all, all, always this kind of electricity uh, in the team and that sort of gets you going and of course thirdly the thing is you have to enjoy the company of people you're uh, working with and i was very i've been very fortunate in working with uh, uh, aman rohan uh, siraj arjun all these uh, now pew and all these people who are who we are working with who are, uh, like we all get along with each other very well so um, um i think you know it's that kind of a, you just have to surround yourself with people who are not going to say june ho gaya abhi tak kuch nahi hua you know that's the worst kind of thing like that's the pressure at least in the first year that one has to relinquish one it's like a phd you know it's like the phd also sort of trains yourself uh, for i've given you a good segue for the next question i know i was just going to ask you you know so you've done a phd right and um, i'm wondering how these two tracks helped each other right i'm i'm sure your filmmaking was helping your phd and your phd was helping your filmmaking right and and the phd obviously meant a certain engagement with theory which perhaps not all filmmakers necessarily have i mean you know many of us have been through a film education some not uh, you know even if you've been through a film education you don't always keep your engagement with theory going you know yeah. but you're somebody who's been sort of in the thick of theory and practice right so i'm very curious to know how these two have come together in your practice you know and how they have right. revealed themselves right uh, they're still revealing themselves it's still um, uh, the jury's still out on that but the um, uh, Okay, let me put it this way. I think it's a double-edged sword. I'm going to talk about the positives and the very dangerous negatives of it. The positives are that um, even within the PhD, the academic world, I was interested in conceptual stuff. You know, so um, um, the thing is that um, so, for instance, Series of Sleep started with uh, I came across we in class discussed this text by this remarkable French philosopher called Jacques Rancière, who written this thing called Nights of Labor, which is about thinking about the night or horizontality in a different sort of way and that sort of and i was also myself for the longest time struggling with insomnia so i started thinking about how one thinks of sleep or the realm of the night in the city like how one thinks of the urban through the lens of sleep differently so that's how it starts so the initial kind of a, um uh the incipient sort of uh, you know it comes as a kind of warm glow at the back of your head right you have a sweet sense of texture or something right and that texture i think for me was initially informed by a kind of conceptual uh, interest area and then what happens is you meet characters and the sheer blunt force of their lives takes a tsunami that takes over the your sense of what you think the film was and it just takes over everything but if you keep every now and then going back to the original idea of that i was interested in this as a concept as a philosophical or uh, emotional idea even and that sort of undergirds it becomes a kind of scaffolding of the uh, film that so it sort of helps you it's uh, it's a little like um, you know we'd gone for uh, yesterday uh, kevel arora the guy who uh, the pe- person who runs the place here society I, we'd gone for his uh, farewell and somebody asked him if players was ever a, 
uh, you know what it was like for him politically and one analogy that he used which was very interesting for me he said that you know very often it's little like if there's a line of ants and you put a hand vaguely around it if it goes to a distance where it's really warding off then you just say well maybe not then you put a hand there and it'll go in some other direction so you so uh, the film also i think takes on a kind of like it becomes a beast and takes on a life of its own entirely um the so the okay coming back so the academic stuff helps in sharpening thought it allows you to read much more it allows you to tick the box of okay so if you're looking at sleep or in this film if you're looking at say the human animal relationship man bird and so on so the first two three months was just uh, trying to read as widely as possible and figuring out how people had spoken about birds be it as ornithologists as poets as philosophers as ethnographers anthropologists you know historians and so on uh, so i was reading for instance hs for hawk or the peregrine which is this fabulous book written by in the 1960s by this british guy who was almost ravenously or obsessively in love with this one peregrine falcon this one bird so that kind of a relationship which is this kind of which presented the bird as this kind of wondrous otherworldly magical being was what i started initially getting interested in so you can call this i don't know if it's academic but it's bookish possibly it's interested in the world of ideas and concepts and in that way i think academics helped me the downside is that what look academics also often completely stultifies and renders thought inert and calcifies it and contains and you know rigidifies it so and it gives you a kind of confidence or a sort to cut through the world and you feel like because everything is about making sense and being able to categorize and you know classify and codify into set structures and shapes and this uh, it also like it sometimes kills a sense of wonder and a sense of awe because things get contained and they get domesticated and tamed you know and the whole point is to when you're begin a, beginning a film it's like a free fall right you've jumped off a cliff and it's like the whole idea is that it's untamed and the film is the slow process of taming or familiarizing yourself with the uh uh you know build this sudden um uh, force field that you encountered so um the problem with academics is that it domesticates that it tames so you have to be always very careful of that but for me it's actually two different parts of the brain like initially when i'm reading i read 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 and like then a uh, like a small diary becomes full of notes but then once you've encountered the world which you're shooting life itself is in plotting action right life is uh agential in a way which completely overruns any other premeditated designs that you had conceptually but the point is to like somehow maintain some of the color of the original uh thought so i think in that way but for me try, i try and distinguish it when i'm shooting i'm not reading at all but prior to the, uh this thing i think it helps to uh i'm saying i because in this case none of the other people uh, have academic backgrounds and only uh, i do but so initially read, read 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 then a lot of shooting and then on the edit again read 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 read, read. so that's how it's gone for me right um and and do you think uh you know in the way in which you imagine films you know that also must have been affected and and been impacted uh, you know in a, in a positive way uh, by by uh, you know the engagement with theory so i mean there is one body of theory which is to do with what you were looking at you know the larger sort of philosophical question but mm-hmm. how to look at that larger philosophical question would have also sort of emerged uh, you know from uh, you know i mean i'm with with your uh, would have emerged from your great emotion in the idea of film right and and right. and looking at it in multiple ways which brings me to my next question which is you know how do you define your own creative process you know mm. how much of the film gets made in your head mm. you know would you shoot it and then just slap it uh, you know on the edit table and then you try and figure out how it will make sense you know tell us a little about that Right, so there's still a lot of set process because I'm I'm still very early on, obviously. But I think some of the patterns that uh, I could delineate, or especially in this film, is that uh, so it started off with basically, look, all of us are uh, if you're living in Delhi through the winters, the thing that you're uh, hit in the face literally with is this kind of a pervasive greyness, right? That laminates our entire lives, right? And it's a kind of texture of greyness of a greenness that you're breathing in a greenness that you're inhabiting or suspended in and that sort of like thing is uh, that this dystopic world of the hazy sky and the sun is this kind of tiny 
um, diffuse blot and you have these tiny lazy dots uh, gliding which are the black kites that's how it began like i'd uh, i'd be driving to say nmml to write or something and all, uh, on say the brt crossing i'd stop and you look up and you see these you're always seeing these chills uh, gliding right and after a while i started basically thinking of what happens when a kite falls down and that's when i'd gone to the uh, uk uh, for a small fellowship um, and there i was uh, housed in the department of geography uh, at uh, cambridge and there are lots of people who are working on human animal relationships you know so i got very interested in that kind of thing so truth be told the immersion in theory in terms of cinema studies i not read a single word of cinema studies or cinema philosophy since my dissertation submission two and a half years ago so it's uh, that i and i don't think like that i'm not very into just now but what it does is that it uh, gives you a kind of i think uh, appetite and stamina to read other kinds of disciplines so i was reading a lot of these, this kind of human animal stuff so um, in terms of process i think i knew that i wanted and like i was thinking i read this the peregrine by j a baker this book and it that like you know gobsmacked me because that book this one guy follows this one bird for almost 10 years i mean not one bird one, one bird species the peregrine falcon and it's a remarkable piece of literature you know the kind of hypnotic uh, ravenous love that he has for this one bird it it's there's almost this kind of transspecieistic um, desire to become that was very very interesting and i basically then started vaguely looking for people who have a deeper or profound relationship with the skies or with birds and i said the bird is a good kind of a both a literal and a metaphorical presence to think about ecology so initially how it starts with if you looked at uh, like things that i was scribbling uh, carelessly would be that it's a triangulation between sky as the uh, sky slash air the bird and a human niche huh um this was the vague sort of triangulation um and the feelings that i wanted was of awe and you know like to think of a sort of fairy tale gone dark so gone dystopic so uh, initially i wanted some kind of charisma around this one bird this one sort of one relationship of awe and otherworldly wondrousness so we started researching around that and i just knew that it would be good to get a human life that is otherwise very Uh, that's taking place in a very stifled claustrophobic setting so that one could cut between extreme compression and decompression which is the vista of the city itself the horizon of the city itself because i think it helps to if you're thinking of something really big it actually helps to really home in on something which is very particular and to find characters that embody a big and you know if you really look at people long and hard enough it could be anybody you know in part of any radical thought has to be to be able to imagine that every human being obviously has complexity in them and they have like you know there's a equitable distribution of complexity and layers in people and if you look long enough in at any person that one person opens up for you the whole saga of epic highs and angelic virtue and the worst kind of basest kind of just one person has that whole sweep of emotions right or like the whole moral saga can be played out there so we were looking for people who could sort of like personify or embody some of the ideas initially and that's when we met the brothers saud and adeem and there we basically these people who are um, working with 30 black kites that are falling daily and they're working in this tiny dingy very claustrophobic sort of a basement which is um uh, where there's a lot of industrial decay and heavy metal cutting machines and in the middle of that you see these magisterial words being treated so it's Uh, the basic thing that i wanted like a very stifled space which becomes a kind of a optic into this bigger thing felt like it was a right diagram for me the other thing in terms of process is that look you shouldn't i think know the ending of the film at all or anything beyond the middle because it has to evolve and your own life becomes fodder for the film right so if i have woken if i have barely slept last night and i'm relating to the world in a certain way then that texture will help me think of an image that will also make it swing to the film right so your own life becomes a kind of like so personally for me for instance and we shot through 
the disastrous second wave of covid and there were many tragedies in the crew and people had fallen very sick i had fallen very sick other crew members had fallen very sick uh, we'd all had a big uh, i'd lost my dad very suddenly and uh, shockingly and so on so the i think the film sort of took on a kind of somberness or a, it took on a gravitas that we didn't begin with and the reason why i'm um, elaborating on this is to say that your life becomes for the for the film right whatever is happening with you what it's and which is why you need time and you need a kind of open disposition for things to sort of flow in so intuitively things then start evolving you just have to have you know you have to show up and you have to have good hearing like because you're constantly all of us have these tiny voices which are ki film agar ye ho to it would be interesting would stay with it and then push it so i think writing down a lot of ideas would be my two cents and um allowing for your own life to sort of pour into the uh, uh, film which is why it makes sense for things to be long that's all yeah because you also evolve right with the subject with the people you know you also change and then that brings in its own sort of uh, cues yeah. um so tell me when when you were filming um were there you know because you'd been filming for a while right you'd been doing verite style for a while mm-hmm. so after a point because i mean i noticed that you know in certain scenes you know the lighting was just perfect you know so did you also know that okay i know what kind of scenes i want so let me just set it up and then you know i know that okay in this kind of a setting this is the kind of conversation that will probably emerge so how much of that did you do and how much of it you know was made on you know so how much of preconception in a way right. how much planning went into the filming of it right so for this is a great question for this film because you know series of sleep was as rugged an ethnographic film as can be you know it is really like Five D on करो चलो जो भी मिलता है keep shooting sort of style so it was very run and gun very rugged whatever you find is snatches of you this was a far more um, aestheticized curated you know tripod set controlled motion sort of thing so it was more cinematic in the more traditional sense of the word and also the idea required a kind of dreaminess like the because they're birds and you're talking about your child like they're talking about their childhood and what the bird stands to mean today in today's ecological situation and so on so it required a kind of a dreamy aestheticized um, that needed to be the treatment so we couldn't have a very handheld sort of a thing so what we developed i mean i'm saying developed as if in a self conscious way but it organically evolved into something which is that initially the first um, many months we were just doing very to figure out what the rhythms and the quotidian life the everyday banal quotidian life of the places okay so that's like two hard drives full of footage jisme se kuch nahi aaya right like nothing of it made um it into even the timeline okay like premiere also didn't even get imported right but that was very important because that's the foundation on which you stand because essentially that's where you um start figuring out okay this character reacted in this way and this is what happens every day thankfully where we were shooting is also a very cyclical kind of a place every day birds come um a guy carries them in a carton brings them to a basement and things start happening and then of course it's very bizarre and it's an absurd and surreal space uh, where we were shooting but some actions were the same so what we then started deciding is that our tendency usually is that if this is character and character is walking you go you know and because you're moving you're also having to shift focus with your hand so the this thing is constantly coming so you're constantly made aware of the fact of the camera and the filmmaker in some cinematic universes it works in some it doesn't i did not want that i wanted to make a very cinematic set pc sort of a thing in this film, unlike the previous one so here i couldn't do the uh, whole handheld thing so we decided that what we're going to do once you had a ton of like the very thing already in the bag we thought that even the very day human footage we what we would do is that we put two tripods and put a slider in the middle and through the day just keep doing constantly and after a while you figure out like person's going so even if the person's exited frame you you'll catch up to him or her right because the space is limited so what that does is it has a kind of a languorous and a languid sort of a slow pace which i think um Uh, opens up a more poetic register. Similarly, we one day just get like a tiny one of those mini cranes, and we just keep doing, like uh, with Rijuju the cinematographer, we keep doing 
so that you know you figure out uh, movements that are interesting then the film is one part is the humans and i don't want to over determine it because there's also a lot of animals in the film right and there we took forever because so just the opening rad shot we took a full uh, almost a week like five days because we figured out this place um, uh, near old delhi where there's lots of rats that come and we couldn't come close because the rats would then run away so we figured this can be uh, ben contrived this uh, uh, he devised this own sort of uh, crane thing he put a monopod on a tripod and hung it on like a complicated thing and basically we kept trying different movements and with animals they're obviously disobedient they don't care about your design right so you but you figure out motion and that also gives a kind of very lively magic to it so you keep shooting keep shooting keep shooting and then so i think the sense of designed curated sense that you're saying it's very very you're right and i very much wanted it that way i very much wanted it to feel like a the experience should be like you're watching a fiction film in the sense not in the sense of the artifice of it but i was uh, we were using the tools of fiction to tell a non fiction story so we were using a crane shot we were using dollies tracks all of that but the idea was to tell and with animals and birds you can still take those liberties because you know if you know that there's this bird at the distance you can set up a crane and do a slow track in or something right so uh, the idea was to really dip into the toolkit of fiction and tell a non fiction story so as a aesthetic package it looks like uh, uh, fiction yeah and some of those words you used you know, those are exactly the words playing in my mind you know, it's poetic it's languorous you know and and yeah and and you get this feeling of fiction even though you know it is non fiction so uh, absolutely uh, tell me a little about your editing process you know so you have uh, it couldn't have been easy to i mean of course you you wanted this this effect so you knew that you know that's that's the final footage that you know would make it to the film but even then you know were there points when you were like you know oh i got that moment you know on that day on the whatever in the fifth month of filming uh, but you know it's not looking were there moments like those you know how did you take those editing decisions um you know did, did you sort of put together a some kind of a pre edit script and then you know filled in the blanks you know just just talk us through that you know i'm very intrigued to so know no no pre edit script at all but the thing that i'll uh, always swear by and i'll always do is to edit during the shoot i mean i can't emphasize that enough especially for this kind of film where you're probably coming back with 300 hours of footage right so just think about it and this will be true of most of the if you look at say kushu uh, unes film or deepthi fahad's uh, like an insignificant man or um, katya was or uh, i'm sure with uh, 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 cinema travelers as well and uh, with sushmit jintu also or say archana's uh, uh, film or abhay especially all these films they have a ton of footage right and i think what happens is that um, you have to um, you can't do the thing where you shoot and then the shutters come down on shooting and then the world of editing begins because uh, i mean 300 ghante footage to dekhne mein at least you'll spend like 3 months right and then why when you finish watching that footage you forget the opening bits that you'd seen and then you start watch it again and then you're in footage section and watching it ad infinitum ad nauseum forever so uh, i'm saying this from uh, experience because that's the hell hole in which my life had plunged uh, during series of sleep because i'd done this clean kind of cleaving between the two um with with this what in all that beats what we did was that towards the latter half of the film during the production schedule when our cinematographer riju was shooting in delhi we already had an editor called vedan joshi who was working on the base edit and all of us are also living vaguely in the same house so there was this kind of like very community kind of like making films together sort of a, a thing and um so the last 5 months almost the edit was happening simultaneously to the shoot because as you are constructing the opening sequence and of course the opening spiel you think is the cat's whiskers and you think is great and then two days later you realize it's an absolute mess right so because it's very self indulgent and you're trying to like uh, you've lived with something for two years and you want to give it time and um, it's nowhere close to being as ruthless as you need it to be so then you realize that okay this shot is not working because it's taking two and a half minutes so we maybe need to shoot we have to figure out a snail shot again so of course you then need to send 
a unit out to again recce and then you go and shoot so there's this constant kind of a cross pollination between abhi footage aaya literally they can you insert it into the timeline and see if it's working to the point that we've had a, it so far as that um teen teen minutes se 4 minute tak ke liye ek shot chahiye and i think it has to be a long line of ants for instance there's no such shot in the film but suppose there is uh, we need something like that the then we say okay minute long shot and then you're we are sitting with the dp and figuring out the choreography of a shot which will take cut to cut 45 seconds you know with of course human protagonist you can't do that but in this film there was a lot of non human elements right so i'm a great believer and a huge evangelist for uh, editing while shooting because those two worlds have, together when they're, they the grammar of the film actually develops when that's happening right and that's when you have full control over it then after doing a base edit and um, coming up with this sprawling 3 hour behemoth mess of a film um, which you think is the you know like is really something but over time get a sneaking suspicion that maybe it's really terrible um, with that we went to copenhagen to edit with this person called charlotte bengson who had edited before the films like acts of killing uh, act of killing and more recently the truffle hunters which is structurally very good edit wise so that's why i wanted to work with her so we went with her with a 3 hr kind of a mess and then the next few months there we were basically just chiseling and sculpting is like she's also a very playful kind of editor so and i tend to be a slightly more cerebral person which on the edit doesn't help at all because uh i would say this shot after this shot after this shot this collage together means this and she would initially say what means what do you mean means you know it's what is your stomach feel and initially i would be like what do you mean what do you, what is your stomach feel but over time i realized that there is an emotional logic that cumulatively in here is like comes to be through the course of the film and um you know like all common editing mistakes that all of us have made is that we edit section 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 so a 10 minute section works but when you put it with a 20 minute section suddenly doesn't work at all because it feels really long right so you really have to do this thing of constantly watching and those are some of the things that we picked up with her because there's you have to keep watching once every week so even if you're on the 30th minute or you're at the 45th minute you have to keep seeing what the overall shape of it is you know otherwise you have a great section which is 10 minutes long and it comes in the 40th minute but cumulatively just doesn't hold so i think after a base cut which is not a rough cut which is very far from very earlier from a um a rough cut after a base cut it helps so at least like in this one it helped me a lot to um basically you know figure out the um what the various lives of the film are and then start killing them one after the, like you know like start canceling them one after the other till you whittle down to a point where you feel like i've marauded my film and it's just what have i done and it's like uh, really bare bone and too clinical but that's actually the best bit where you've really been very ruthless so and that's something we picked up with her you know another thought that comes to mind is you know i mean this entire process that you're talking about it's so meditative you know this whole thing of patience just being with your material you know first you know you look for money then you you know just film and then you get into this process of editing and you know i find it quite interesting because you know uh, if you were to look at the kind of content that is usually being put out and that audiences are becoming used to you know it's all in these bite sized uh, versions right it's all 2 minutes 3 minutes uh you know and i think that is again a real challenge for younger filmmakers because you know to earn your livelihood perhaps this is the kind of work that you have to do um but um, you know when you want to make a film you know to even how do you even decide and that's a question that in fact keeps coming up you know how do you even decide that you know this the story i want to tell is a feature length story what if it's a 30 minute story or a 20 minute story you know am i am i making it a feature length film so i can you know do this whole thing of okay get 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 in the funding and you know there are all these questions that come in um and i'm wondering if you ever had to sort of grapple with it you, were you absolutely sure that this was a feature length film you wanted to tell uh, that you wanted to make and this was a story that required you know that kind of time and commitment and so on so the second act that's for me the differentiating factor between what can be a long shot and what can be a feature length thing so actually a lot of the films that you can make for 40 minutes you can also make for 90 minutes 
right but for me it's like um the first act and the third act would have similar beats but it's the second act dramaturgically i mean it's the second act and when you're when you've established the world and before you're you've gone into the crisis world of it but uh, the middle of the film where there's not just world building but you're also pushing at ideas is when you have that's what one has to think of to see if there's enough stuffing for a 90 minute or i have never made a short film in my life so i actually don't i'm not familiar with that grammar at all so for me it's not a thing that i you know it's like i um, i don't think in short film world worth it so it's not a quandary that i've had to be honest um in terms of the the fact that we are constantly uh, distracted by a short termness of life itself and like you know life is getting constantly compressed and abbreviated about that of course you are constantly assaulted by fleetingness and transience of media material and all of us are as much this thing to doom scrolling but uh, for me what happens is that especially in the initial part when you are finding the life of the film it's really when i said that your life becomes fodder for the film i have to be very careful to the point of me being paranoid about what i'm putting in into my like what i'm seeing so i mean i can't then see any show anything that requires a timeline of for instance eight episodes i can't i have to keep seeing things that have a 90 minute thing so that you internally have this kind of a sense of the intuitive rhythm of a 90 minute structure i make a filmography of say the 10 films that i think so for this film there was two filmmakers like viktor kosakovsky or jean franco rossi right so i watched all their films to get a sense of rhythm you know and you have to it's a little like it's a diet you know it's like what you're watching you have to be very careful about what you're putting in because i think other things can contaminate what you're thinking of so there has to be some discipline as well it's not easy and i really also struggle with it because you always tempted to get on to some more fun show when you're tired or something later to relax but the uh, i try and watch only people who in the constellation of filmmakers who i think are of in the neighborhood of things that i would be interested in so um uh, yeah so i think that's one if you keep watching say on 10 consecutive days or 9 consecutive days keep watching films who what that you really respect and admire not necessarily that you love and are in the vicinity of film the film that you're imagining and you think you want to push that envelope a bit then eventually by the 11th day you have the match fitness for it you know okay i'm going to open it up for questions now so if if anybody has questions please write them in the q and a box you'll see the icon at the bottom of your screen we have a few questions here already um shonak um there's bilal asking you know talking heads are not honored worldwide in documentaries why why has this change happened and he also wants to know what obstacles you encountered but i think you've spoken about that in obtain, obtaining a grant and financing for the film uh so yeah he wants to know about uh you know talking heads and you know that you know how that has changed over the years i think there is a certain um uh, i think there's a certain um onus that's currently placed on creative uh, non fiction which is uh, which doesn't have talking heads that's correct um however having said that i don't think it's the case that talking head in the just in the last four years in the festival says i love talking heads beyond a point the thing is how you do talking heads you know i think when we use the word talking heads what we are doing is what we are referring to is actually a shorthand for very often a pedantic boring thing of just a person in front of a white wall in a suit talking or you know it's it's boring because and it's unimaginative because it's pedantic and very often didactic right it's it's prescriptive which is why it's boring that kind of um, uh, talking heads i also really don't have the taste for however if you just look at the history of talking head films look at how errol morris has done talking heads look at how herzog interviews people you know it's like um in the worst herzog films also you know that film on capital punishment where he's talking to a priest and initially is talking to the priest about what he talks to people about for on death row and initially the guy is giving very you know like humdrum vanilla answers and then suddenly herzog asks him describe to me the last encounter with an animal that moved you and the priest says that in the morning i was this morning i was playing golf and 
I was driving the golf cart and I suddenly stopped because I saw a squirrel coming. And for a brief second, we looked at each other and I suddenly thought of the resplendence of nature and life. And then I thought of what I do and he breaks down. And you know, there's in that brief moment in an otherwise, to my mind, unexciting film, it's a, there's something that happens and like, you know, he does the interview form really, really well. I think Joshua Oppenheimer does the interview form really, really well. So it's about what you do. The interview in itself is a very, it's, it's people talking. Of course, it's not uninteresting. Of course, it's not. I think the talking head word has come to uh, hint at a particular syntax of unimaginative question. That's what it is. And no, I mean, look at the, uh, like, look at a lot of the recent films that have done well. A lot of them have interviews. It's simply not true that uh, that doesn't work. Right. Uh, we have two uh, uh, questions about the sound in your film, one from Sunita and the other from Nilanj. Uh, so Sunita asks, um, uh, you know, how, how did you think about the sound design of the film? Uh, right. You know, from the development phase to production and post, and and Nilanj pretty much asks the same question. You know, how do you approach sound design in this film? Right, right. So sound. The thing is that I'd really messed it up in Cities of Sleep, and even though it was a film that was very replete with, it's the night time. You know, it's like it can have really magisterial uh, soundscape and like uh, really cinematic. But um, so I was very, I was constantly uh, regretful of how the sound experience went there. So in this film, we were constantly, but actually I don't think I'm very good in terms of thinking with sound in terms of pre-planning. I'm not good with it. It doesn't come to me naturally. So I actually rely on people who are assisting, et cetera, who had a better knack of it initially. I have a far better knack of it in the post. So what we did is that initially there was this um, uh, sound uh, record just called Moinak and then uh, uh, this person called uh, uh, Nilu. Uh, who did sound with us and um, basically uh, what we did was we figured out that because we were shooting birds in a tiny space there's this whole world of texture right feathers and tiny this thing so okay I'll put it this way very often with a camera with the camera when you're beginning to shoot a scene uh, you ask the question am I looking at or am I looking with right and that determines where you place the ca camera, where you, what the grammar of the camera is. Like if I'm looking at, then it's obviously a bit more clinical, etc. If I'm looking with, there's obviously an angular, this thing where I'm oriented towards the space in front of the uh, character, right? It's just a basic kind of pillar to think about where you place the camera. With sound, I think it has a very important, this thing in terms of intimacy or proximity with the characters. So for instance, um, certain things make you feel, feel skin, right? So if you feel this sort of a sound, you feel a kind of tactile viscerality. You feel a kind, that kind of a sensorial tactility, right? And you feel close to the characters. The minute you lessen that, you don't feel. So it's all, I mean, ultimately all of uh, filmmaking in every scene is manipulating what you uh, want to accentuate and what you want to diminish, right? So it's entirely based on what you're, so for instance, here we knew that there were bits where there's there are nostalgic sections of the of childhood where they, they talk about kites in their childhood and it becomes a metaphor for a uh, like a charmed past as it were and there we completely cut out all diegetic sound for instance in other or for instance how do you think of the sound of smoke or pollution in delhi and for me it's there's a kind of gray metallic taste that all of us feel between november to december you know this it's a weird metallic thing that clogs your nose and your innards right um, for me, I, I, if the sound had to be a bit raspy, like that had to be the thing. So in recording, you're basically, okay. So if the people who've asked are technical, uh, uh, like they're also uh, uh, people who work to the craft. So I would record sound, obviously fully high fidelity. And then sometimes all the actions that were happening, I would try and get them done again, just for the sound separately to create another layer on the side. Then in the post, we worked very very hard in uh, Copenhagen where we were doing the uh, sound post where uh, with somebody called uh, Thomas where basically the um, uh, we did a lot of foleying and uh, I it, it seems prohibitive and to most of 
our colleagues in uh, the documentary circuit in uh, India. Ki Foley, I don't think a lot of films do. But even if it means not spending too much and getting a friend who works in audio to do Foley, I would still recommend it because it really changes things a lot. In the first shot, if there's a great sound, people get immersed in like nothing else. So doing really good Foley and then also figuring out it during the 5.1, working on the panning carefully, especially when characters are talking, you know, like distribution of uh, the sound. These things, they feel like they're unnis piece ka fark, but they really, really matter. So I've learned that through this film, through the failure of the previous film, actually. Right. A lot of people are asking, how do we get to watch your film? That's that's a million dollar question, isn't it, Shonak? Yeah, no, um, it uh, it's a million dollar question for Series of Sleep because, you know, that preceded the world of movie and all of that. So there... I was very trigger happily showing the film around and whoever uh, would show it, like colleges, all kinds of screen spaces. But then I just didn't know what to do with the film. But that is back in the day. Now the film is, um, it's going to be on HBO in about three to four months, I think. Like by the end of the year, basically it will be on HBO. So whoever wants to watch it, it will be available for sure. It's um, with this film, the anxiety about God, how do we show it to people is uh, thankfully is not there as much, you know. So, um, and the thing is, it's not like we are delaying. This is common practice for most films. Like when it finishes the festival uh, round, like we're still on the road. We've actually shown in very few festivals so far because we had to wait for Cannes after Sundance. So there was a four month still lag in the middle. Uh, now we're constantly showing in other festivals. And once the festival uh, run is done in about say three, four months, it'll be on HBO. Right. Um, we have another question from Vishwanath who's asking, how is the film different from a regular climate change doc? I don't know what a regular climate change doc is. I don't know if there's a specific subset that homogenizes um, that thematic. Um, I mean, I've seen some, you know, I, you would probably say that even a film like Viktor Kosakovsky's Antipodas is vaguely about a planetary imagination so the word climate change the problem is that because it's now such a familiar lexicon of things that it like harkens things that are a bit overly fatigued and uh, boring but uh, things that have to do with a planetary sort of broader uh, question are quite exciting i don't know how it's different from a uh, film or climate change because i don't really know what the formula or the script of climate change film is but if you mean films that I personally have a distaste for films that are overly either this, it's a kind of binary, right? It's a Manichaean kind of binary where at one point it's either overly gloom and doom bleak, where you feel like, uh, you know, the end of the world is around the corner. And I don't know if it helps too much. Or the other is that there's a kind of bleeding heart um, uh, sentimentalism that one um, uh, sort of, uh, in some ways came to hold a lot of um, purchase in the global West and has a certain kind of way in which it shows a kind of like, it, it has, you know, it's very vitalistic and it has a kind of nativist sentimentality, etc., which uh, is also not interesting. But uh, I mean, I was interested in thinking about human, non-human entanglements and interrelationships between humans and non-humans within an urban space so it's a film about urban ecology and urban nature so i suppose in that sense it if uh, that takes the box of it being slightly different sort of says uh, a big hug shanak your life becomes part of your film that's a great realization so i'm, I'm guessing you know sort of already oh, like so suddenly right of course yeah. <laughs> um and um Okay, Nilanch is also asking if you can recommend a book or a film that can help in forming a base understanding of how to carve a story, uh, you know, how to tell your story. But I'm guessing that would be different for different things, right? I mean, there's no one. Yeah, I mean, the general film books that I really like, the how-to books have never helped me. They never help because, uh, you know, anything that is, you can't use somebody else's lottery tickets to win a lottery, right? Like what they've used to win it can't be replicated so it's um, nothing prescriptive or formulaic will ever work what really has uh, like uh, what i'm very into of late and has helped me actually is reading biographies of filmmakers so you know like i uh, love a lot of uh, uh, like ray's writing Satya ray's writing is great i've been reading a lot of um, 
uh, Ingmar Bergman's uh, this thing is very good. Sidney Lumet's uh, 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 autobiography is very good. Um, Elia Kazan's uh, autobiography is decent. So those are some of the books. And you know what you need actually is less a thing about craft, but more a thing about almost like a spiritual companionship when you're making the film. Right? That's what you actually need in that. And that these books provide you. Right? In the form of a book or yeah. a book. I you need some kind of companionship and you know like it's like what art does right you feel like oh somebody else has felt this yeah, yeah. terrible anxiety that i'm feeling right now about whether the thing that i'm deep diving into and devoting my life to will ever see the light of day and okay somebody else was also constantly fumbling about like this and that person made this creative film so uh, i think that sort of a thing helps i would also recommend uh, listening to a lot of interviews on youtube and you know whoever your favorites are like listening to the masters and then so watching a film that you really love mm -hmm. and it could be anybody like it could be um, say um, an inaritu film and then watching say five interviews of inaritu in terms of the process of it that for me helps a lot so i a film usually takes a day and a half because you're very drawn into and like you if you really love the film and then you try and read as vociferously as you can about it and then listen to the so i think that kind of thing helps a how-to book i don't think is ever ever help you i mean five seasons cinematography and all of that was good in um, college you know but it's those are not helpful at all during practice of um, Sunita wants to know how we can watch Cities of Sleep. Is that are you planning to make it available on movie? I mean, if people uh, write me, then I usually am very trigger happy in sending the link around. Um, right now, we're having a very preliminary conversation with movie, and if all goes well, then hopefully it can be on a platform. Right. right. So, um, before we end, uh, Shanak, just wondering. I mean. Of course, I think what what this conversation shows uh, more than anything else is that you know you have to trust your own journey, right, and your own process, and and there has to be that relationship between you and what the story you want to tell. But even then, if there would be like some you know advice that you'd like to give uh, to people who who you know who are on this journey, who are perhaps already you know struggling. Uh, trying to make sense of their footage, wondering whether or not they should go on, you know, maybe they've been through. And like you said, right, I mean, there's this unrealistic expectation of being great proposal writers as well. And, and you know, that is the first yeah. necessary step. And it's very unfair because not everybody should yeah. be given the burden of having a, f a facility with language. It's very, very unfair. And it's extremely tilted towards people who have a kind of, uh, you know, like a certain schooling a certain it's definitely very 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 unfair because it's totally linguistically divided 100 percent. so my okay let me not zoom out and say bigger things but let me say smaller prescriptive things that help me and maybe that can be part of a toolkit for uh, uh people who are just starting out also the i think maintaining a diary wherein at one part have different iterations of length in terms of your film have a log line in terms of at its core, the film is around this. A longer thing ki is, is, is bare mein hai. And a much longer thing where you can ramble and say, ye bhi hoga, ye bhi hoga, ye bhi hoga, ye bhi hoga. And understand that at an initial stage, of course, you can't have the answers in terms of what the film will be. It's a documentary. You can't, right? But speculate. Have, like, go into fully, ye aise hoga, texture ye hoga, ye aise hoga. And of course, when you start filming, everything will be different. Of course, it will not conform to what you imagine. But what you imagined really helps you, um, really helps you sort of like uh, build some foundation or predicates of on which you will build on. So definitely do that. It's a great exercise. Um, write uh, down notes, not like don't sit for an hour every day and write down notes, but carry something with you like a, it could be Evernote as an app or it could be a pen and paper. Uh, write down notes on camera movements when an image comes to your mind uh, like uh, it helps me to think of is it a track in or is it a, a zoom in or is it like a focus shift like you know what's the grammar that is intuitively coming from inside and usually that becomes the best kind of grammar for it so that becomes a central core and around it becomes the um, you know the padding around it so uh, I think listening to the tiny voices in your head in terms of you know, if, and all of us have it, if I said right now, think of an image of your father, very happy, 
an image of your dad really happy a lot of us right now naturally thinking of a close up some of us are thinking of a track in some of us have a long shot of him maybe reading the newspaper and laughing or you know on the phone with some old friend like you know all of us have di- these vignettes of different images but hold on to your vignette not just in terms of the content but what you're seeing around it so and that becomes a kind of core i think to how once um uh, b- the building blocks of the this thing also maybe in the diary uh, write down 10 6 7 films that you think and explore on the world wide web i mean that uh, that always helps so figure out like keep clicking 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 hyper linking away to figuring out what films okay this is really good this is really good from this this character treatment is good from this this sort of a montage style is good sort of a thing this edit is good and then watch it often so that you know it's like basically you're making a box around your head and you're like a horse that and you're putting blinkers around your this thing so because in the first part you really need like it helps to have that kind of a thing so i think it's like basically increasing match fitness in the early part when you're shooting all of that totally washes away and gets uh, goes to waste so not then but it helps to have it in the initial part and on a broadest level patience absolutely like understand that you're in for the long haul it's a two to three year process and if you do well everything will follow the festivals will follow and like to basically soldier on you know that's the toughest bit and i know easier said than done i mean i've been through the whole thing of uh, with the first film not getting through uh, so all of that you know it's like uh, just basically showing up every day shooting and staying at it long enough and keeping in touch with the community dockage is great i mean this kind of a platform is uh, great uh, pitching at places like sheffield um, itfa forum ifp new york hong kong dmc Uh, all of those kinds of places where you are constantly hitting mentors or saying what you are doing bouncing both all of that so all of that really does go a long way and also feeling a sense of community it really goes a long way so so what's next for shonak what are you planning to do um uh, somebody who was the associate director on our film uh, on all that beats and also on a series of sleepers just begun a uh, work on a uh, non fiction in bombay that i'm sort of co-directing and um, producing creatively and so on um some uh, helping on that but uh, that's not the central uh, sort of this thing of it um i think i want to make a, a fiction now um and vaguely on the like i'm interested in the ecological sublime as a broader form so something around that i don't know what but I, right now i'm in the library stage of things right 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 thank you so much we wish you all the very best thank you so much for sharing your journey with us um, you know um, and 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 um, you know coming here and, and and that is something that i've always known about you i've always known you as a very generous person who uh, you know happily shares tips happily shares contacts uh, you know your own learning your own uh, perspectives and you know you've done just that and and not just for the people who logged in here today but also for all those who will watch it because it will be up on uh, psvt's channel at some point so for all of those who will watch that so thank you so much um and and we hope to be in touch uh, through doc commune as well so thank you thank you and thank you everyone for joining in uh, i know it was a fascinating conversation and i think it left us much food for thought you you really have a mentor inside you shona you know in the way that you talk and uh, yeah so thank you thanks so much thank you thank you bye